Shalom and welcome to another time of Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman. We're continuing our studies in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Now, the last message was for two dates on the calendar, and this one is the same, November 20th and 23rd. I hope you'll uh, understand we're back to um, being out preaching uh, remotely. And um, I just returned from uh, six days in the United States and Northeast, and I'll be uh, returning there tomorrow uh, for another uh, nine days um, in uh, the uh, mid-Atlantic states of uh, the United States. And that will conclude our um, tra traveling for this uh, autumn. So uh, the last message and this one are for two dates on the calendar and it's because we just don't have enough time with uh, travel in between to prepare these things for you. So we hope you'll understand but you'll follow along in the studies nonetheless. We're going to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in what we do here today. Father God, we thank you for Jesus, for eternal life and for everything you do for us in our lives. Use the time now to honor and glorify you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at three verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11, 12, and 13. And this is for November 20th and 23rd, 2022. It says this, And you know, and as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in the, you that believe. Well, there's only three verses here, but they're chock full of what I call vitamin uh, Bible vitamins and minerals things that you need to grow as a believer in Jesus and this was the concern that Paul had now earlier in the uh, same chapter back in verse 7 Paul uses the metaphor of uh, how he we actually he's speaking for himself and those who were with him uh, it was Silas Timothy uh, Luke may have been with him at this time. I'm not uh, exactly sure of the timing, if you'll excuse me on that. But he uses the um, uh, the word uh, here, we, the pronoun we. So it is um, the reflection of the fact that it's not just Paul, he is writing to them here, but he's reminding them of how he uh, looked at them and was concerned for them. And he likens how he looked at them and was concerned for them as uh, like that of a, a young mother who nurses her child and the, and the deep concern to see that their child thrives and grows. And this is the metaphor that Paul is using here. He considers the Thessalonian believers to be uh, his young children whom he wants to see thriving and growing. Now he takes that further, and we went through that passage last time to the, to the end of uh, verse 10, and he takes this further now, but he changes around the, the, how he presents himself. He's not now presenting himself like a, a young mother who's nursing a child, but he's now talking about how he what is acting as a father does with his children. Look again at verse 11. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. Now, that word there, charged, literally means implored. Now, the word implored is, is important here for us to understand. It literally means that someone is taking deep concern for someone's growth in this instance. Someone would continue to further their growth and their understanding of, of things in their lives. So he's exhorting them to grow. Keep growing. And he's going to say that later on in the, these three verses. He also then charges them. Now this is not to be misconstrued as someone is sending someone a bill in the mail as we use the word charged here in, in, in modern contexts. It, it means here literally that he is imploring, he is saying to them, do the things that you need to do. Now, if you've ever been a parent, I have three sons, 
I now have six grandchildren, so along with uh, three sons and uh, now two of them married, I consider the fact that I have five uh, children. Uh, two of my, my two older sons who are married have their wives. They may be referred to as daughters-in-law, with the in-law at the end being what is uh, um, attached to the label. But I've told all of my children and in-law children that if you married my sons, I consider you to be my daughter. And I'm your parent, and my desire is to see you to grow and to become the person that God would want you to become. And that's my continued role. I may have adult children, but I have not stopped being a father. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus, you may be an adult, but you have a father in heaven, and he wants to see you grow, and he will implore you, he will charge you, he will send tests into your life by times, not to punish you. Do not think that God is punishing you when tests um, result in your lives. He's not doing that. What he's doing is that he's creating opportunities for you to grow, to grow as a person that God wants you to be. And we oftentimes grow the best when we have uh, had to go through struggles, difficulties, and trust God to get us through to the other side, not to try and trust our own intellect and think, I, I know how to do this. Okay, God, you sent me this test. I'll figure it out. This is not what God wants you to do. He wants you to be submissive to him. He wants you to wait on him. He wants you to call on him. God, you've sent this or you've allowed this trial, this difficulty. How do you want me to handle it? Show me how you want me to handle it, not how I think I can handle it. Jeremiah the prophet says very clearly that the human heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can understand it? It literally means who can trust it. Our human condition is stained by sin. Each one of us has inherited the sin nature that, comes, that came through Adam and Eve. When they disobeyed God, they brought that sin nature into the human race. And we now have to find ways to get back to God. The thing is, the only way back to God is the way that God provided himself. He came at the right time in history, according to Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. He died exactly as that same chapter reference speaks to, and Isaiah chapter 52 and 53 speaks to. He was raised from the dead. Jo Jonah, the prophet in the belly of the whale, is a, is a metaphorical picture of being dead in the whale, but thrown out on the beach on the third day, alive, to go and minister. And he rose from the dead and conquered death. I've always said it like this, I'll say it again. The most amazing thing that has ever happened in all of human history is that God became a human being like you, like me, and willingly allowed himself to be taken to that Roman cross. Jesus, being fully man and fully God all at once, willingly taken to that Roman cross, executed in the most ignominious, horrific way that has ever been con conceived by man, and he did it willingly. Why? Because God died in your place. He became the lamb to uh, be used as the lamb for the offering. That picture, that metaphorical picture, comes from Genesis 22 where Abraham is going up to the mountain, following in God's instruction, take your son, your only son, and take him up to a place that I will show you, and offer him dead to me on that place. And Abraham, who believed God by faith, did exactly as God told him to do. And when you read that portion in Genesis 22, his son Isaac is following with his father, and they leave the animal at the bottom of the, the, the mountain, and they're heading up, and he's got a, a bucket of coals, probably hot coals, the fire, and he's got wood for the fire, 
And Isaac says to him, Father, where is the lamb for the offering? And Abraham, looking down at his son Isaac, as knowing that his son was as good as dead in his own eyes right there and then, because he was offering him up to God, as God instructed, said these prophetic words, God himself will provide a lamb for the offering. And he laid Isaac out on that uh, rock on the top of the mountain, and was about to raise his hand with the knife in it to take his son's life. And the angel of the Lord came and said, Stop, now I know that you follow God. Do not execute your son like this. This was a test. And then he, he looked over and there was a ram with its horns caught in a, a thicket nearby. And he took that ram, slaughtered it, and offered it on that rock altar at that place as a substitute for Isaac. It's the same picture of Jesus as he's referred to by the uh, writer of the Gospel of John. When John the Baptist sees him, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's not hard to slice the throat of a lamb and have all the blood pour out. They just willingly stay there and don't do a thing. An unblemished lamb needed at the Passover figurative picture of what would happen years later when at the, at the same time of year, the Passover, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, willingly went to die in your place, my place. And when he was said on the cross, it is finished, what he meant was, I have paid the sin for all of human beings for all time, from the past to the present and even into the future. So some of you may say, how can God do that? Or how can anyone claim to be God and do that? Well, God did it, and God can do it, because you read 14 times in Genesis chapter 1 that God literally spoke, and he created heavens and earth and all of the, the world and the universe around us. He created it out of nothing. How did God do that? Where did he come from? Well, that I can't tell you. I don't know. In my finite condition, which can only see what I see in front of me right now, I cannot understand the infinite God. And one day, it says in the scriptures, we will look on him and see him for who he is. And we will be with him eternally, but only if you've accepted the replacement for your need to be on that altar before God, for you to give up your life for God, but you can't ever give up your life for God and have it mean anything because our lives are stained by sin and God can't accept it. So you see, God did it in your place. Why I always say the most amazing thing that has ever happened in all of human history is that God became a person, a human being like you, like me, and willingly went to die in your place. God paid the penalty for your sin. We don't deserve it, but he loved us so much he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in what he did can have and will have eternal life because you are sealed permanently. Once you accept the atoning work of Jesus, you're sealed permanently by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Now we go on here. Here is this father, the Apostle Paul, who is urgently talking to them about how he was so concerned for them. In verse 11, he charged every one of them as a father does his children. And then he goes on to verse 13, uh, 12, and he says, walk worthy of God. Now, it's not that you walk down the street and you look to appear pious and, and well-mannered and, and all the rest. Paul is literally here in the original language saying to them, I want to urgently ask you to walk in a manner that displays God at work in your life. You will, by times, as a follower of Jesus, make a mistake, sin, say something you shouldn't have said, think something you shouldn't have thought. But then God tells us through 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 through 10, don't think you just because you're born again that you can't sin and you haven't sinned, but God is just, righteous, and holy, and he forgives you for your sin. So just go to God on a daily basis. Lord, whatever it is I can remember that I've sinned, sinned against you, forgive me. What I can't remember that I have sinned against you, forgive me again. And you know what it says in that, at the end of that passage? It says this in 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. God is just, God is righteous, God is righteous.
God is holy, he forgives. You, me, we're not just righteous and holy on our own merit. We're only just righteous and holy under the merit of God. Isn't that fantastic? It should be. So it's a reminder here in verse 12 that God is the one who called the Thessalonians to salvation in God's kingdom for God's glory. Look at verse 12. That you walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. When you become a follower of Jesus, it is to give glory to God. In the end, it's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about the eloquent preacher who can say it all. It's about who God is and how he works through those whom he has called. Is he, has he called you? And if he has called you, have you really, truly responded? And then we conclude this portion, thir verse 13. For this cause also, thank you, we, God, without ceasing. God, that you should always be thanking God without ceasing. Again, it's, it's not that you should walk through life uh, trying to appear with this angelic look on your face with your, ha your hands together and, and you're presenting yourself as, as some monasterial uh, monk-like individual. That's not what God is looking for. There are many through the centuries who have thought that that's how they have to portray themselves. Well, that's between them and the Lord. This is not what we're ta taught here, not what we're called to do. We're ta taught here to thank God without ceasing. You don't go through the life and say, oh, hello, thank you, God, it's nice to meet you today. I've known people like that, let me tell you. They're good people, well-intentioned and all, but sometimes with the wrong person, it gets on the other person's wrong side. There are a lot of people who do not love God, do not see God for who he is as we see him. Well, that's between them and the Lord, but you can portray yourself as someone who can be seen as thanking God all the time. I've had people say to me, um, unsaved people, unsaved family, say to me, how did you get through that situation? And all I can say to them is I just thank God that he got me through it. Simply, simple and to the point like that. He says here to um, Give thanks without ceasing. Later on in chapter 5, we'll turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 for a moment. There are some very practical instructions that he gives to the Thessalonian believers in, after the day of the Lord prophecy in chapter 5, how to live daily. And we'll get to this later, but this um, to do something without ceasing is not anything um, that's only appearing once in this letter. He says in verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 5 to pray without ceasing. Again, don't go through life, good, uh, hello Lord, uh, hallow be thy name. Uh, this is not what God wants. You can quietly, within your mind, your, your head, your heart, quietly. Uh, I've oftentimes, been traveling to various locations to teach and preach, I've oftentimes I oftentimes have found myself just praying to God. I'm in the car alone, but just out loud praying to God and saying, thank you for the opportunity you're giving me today. Thank you for allowing me to go. Thank you that you've kept me safe so far. I never turn the car ignition on and put it in gear and leave without praying and saying to God, thank you for allowing me to travel. Keep me safe in these travels. I can tell you that in one year, back in 1993, I had three successive auto accidents. They were very minor fender benders, one after the other after the other. Late winter, early spring, mid spring of 1993. And then my mission director that day, one day after the third one said to me, do you ever pray before you get behind the wheel? I think you need to. And I said to him, no, I really don't. Never thought of it like that. He says, we're told to pray without ceasing. Sometimes I get behind the wheel of the car and head down Interstate 81 or 95 or wherever it is I'm going, and I have to pray without ceasing all the time because of whom I'm around. And that's why I like to drive as far away from everyone else as possible, mainly because it might be me who is the problem on the road. Give thanks all the time. Be grateful all the time. Let that exude out of who you are. You don't have to... Talk a lot about yourself. You don't have to say a lot about yourself. You just simply have to 
have that sense of peace within. I'll tell you, I can tell the person who's at peace with themselves because you just sense it and feel it from how they present themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. I recently left from visiting with someone and in that visit it was very clear at the end that I was leaving someone behind who was genuinely not at peace with themselves and very troubled within. And there was no manner of counsel or anything that I could have given or done at that moment, at that time, to uh, help them to get past what that was. But the thing is that now it's my responsibility to pray without ceasing about that person too. So you see, it's not just about yourself, and it's not just about uh, the things that you do. It's also about the people who are part of your life, who become part of your life. Pray for those whom God has given you contact with. Why? Because he loves them the same way that he, you love God as well. So, you continue. The, the, what, what, what God is trying to get across to us here in, in verse 13 is that we thank God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, you heard of us. You received it not as the word of men, but as, in truth of, uh, as it is in truth, the word of God. He's seeing here the results of the born-again life is that not only is this about their outward and individual presentation, not only is this about their testimony in their daily walk, but it's evident in how they turned to God in the first place. What Paul is getting at here at the mid part and the end of verse 13 is that you heard from us, just mere men, you heard from us and you received the word of God you receive it as the word of, not as the word of men. In other words, just men, simple men like me, but as in truth, the word of God. In other words, you accepted what we said. We reported to you what we believe God to, have, to be doing in the world, and what he has done in Messiah Jesus, what he's going to do when he comes back. Because remember, the latter part of this letter is going to be to sort out some of the eschatological questions that had been brought on by the false letter that they had received, and this letter was to counter that. And so, Paul is saying here, to counter that false teaching, you didn't hear, hear what we had to say me merely because it was us men speaking, but because you took it as it was literally the Word of God, and because of that, it effectually, now that's an old English word, effectually here, at the end of verse 13, and that word just literally means that you welcomed it. You welcomed it and believed it. So if they have wel welcomed it, it was effective as they received it. How are you receiving God's word? Do you spend time in God's word? The Thessalonian believers only had the odd letter from Paul, uh, from Paul and others. We have this whole thing, this whole compendium, this biblos, which means library. We have a library of books. All 66 of them compiled together are the Holy Scriptures. Do you spend time in that? Do you read that? Do you think on it? Do you try to make application to it in your life? Do you seek out others when you don't thoroughly understand a portion? to see how they may be able to help you find out what that has to do and what that has to say to you in your life. How do you walk with the Lord? How do others see you in your walk with the Lord? How do you see God's Word? We are Israel's Hope Ministries and we are a not-for-profit, um, fully faith ministry. We trust God to meet our needs on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis through God's people. And that God would move God's people to perhaps share um, what they're able to share with us so that we can continue to do the work that God has called us to do, such as we're doing here in front of you. It's been a very tough six months. We believe like there are so many other COVID-related things. We've talked with other churches and pastors, and it's the same everywhere. 
that giving is down, and it's down about 20%. And we would pray that the Lord might move those who feel led of the Lord to send a gift to the ministry, not just one, but perhaps small ones on a monthly basis, just to assist us in meeting needs on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis. We are a not-for-profit organization. We it will issue a tax receipt for your gifts annually, usually in January or February of the following year. So if you have um, the ability to do that, we would appreciate it. If the Lord has not laid it on your heart to do that and you don't have the ability to do that, then we ask you to consider to pray for us without ceasing. Go to our webpage www.ihopecanada.org and there you can find various helpful tools that we have there. Uh, if you have a question for me, you just uh, send me an email through there at ron at ihopecanada.org. If you feel led to, lead, to give, hit the support us icon bottom right of the page. It'll take you to the support portal in our webpage. And there you can find uh, an e-transfer um, instruction um, icon. Just click on that. It'll tell you how to give an e-transfer only in Canada, bank account to bank account. Our PayPal account is there as well, and you can give a gift uh, through PayPal. Both those methods are uh, absolutely secure. Uh, or you can send a check in the mail made out to I Hope Canada, and the P.O. Box address in Ottawa, Ontario, it can be found there as well. Thank you again for those who have looked in live today on Facebook Live and others who will uh, look in on our YouTube channel, which can be found at the live YouTube icon on our page there. Just click on that icon and take you in and you can see other uh, messages and series of messages that we've done over the last number of years. Let's stop, let's pray and thank God for our time together. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for eternal life and thank you for everyone who has looked in today or will look in in the coming days and weeks. Use this time now to glorify you, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, until next time, we say Shalom.